Welcome to the ACD seminar, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce John Plain, who, um, or Professor John Plain, um, who uh, started out at uh, University of Cambridge with degrees in chemistry and physical chemistry, and uh, then went to the University of Miami, where he was an associate professor. From there, he went to University of East Anglia um, in Norwich, and he was a lecturer professor of environmental sciences, and now he's professor of atmospheric chemistry at the University of Leeds in the UK. Um, John has um, is members of the uh, European Research Council for the Adva Advanced Grants Review Panel, member of the International Advisory Board of the Max Planck uh, Institute, and is, was editor-in-chief of JSTP. Today he's going to talk about uh, meteoric smoke in the Earth's atmosphere. Right. Well, it's very kind of Dan to have invited me uh, to visit, and I'm here for um, another 11 days or so. So um, if anything comes out of this talk that's of uh, some interest, please uh, get in touch. My office is, well, in the ACD building. Sorry. <laughs> Before uh, the beginning of the talk, I should just acknowledge uh, all the people who have been working with me on this. Uh, the first uh, group of people here are all um, in my group at Leeds, and they are experimentalists, uh, and I'll be showing you work from all of them. Uh, the second group here are modelers. Uh, many of you will know Martin Chipperfield and uh, Wuhu Feng. And um, the third group here are uh, international collaborators, uh, David Nesvorni, who's at the Southwest uh, Research Institute in Boulder, Diego Hancher is at NASA Goddard, and Dr. Monsch. What I want to, uh, or the framework of the talk today, is going to be um, to ask, answer, or try to begin to answer a very simple question, that is, what is the magnitude of the uh, interplanetary dust input into the atmosphere? There, in fact, is uh, a picture caught serendipitously of one of these dust particles ablating. And um, recent estimates of this quantity vary from 2 to 270 tons per day. And that tells you that this is a, a good problem to try to solve. Because once you know what the answer is, at least then you can assess how important it is uh, and what effects interplanetary dust can have in different parts of the atmosphere. And we're going to talk, uh, deal in the talk today all the way from uh, where the dust comes from in uh, the solar system, uh, what happens when it ablates, when these particles hit the atmosphere at very high speeds, and then uh, what happens uh, to the resulting vapors as they make their way down through the atmosphere all the way to the surface. And uh, something I should just define uh, straight away when talking about these quantities of tons per day is what people tend to use in this business, is only a fraction of the dust particles that come into the atmosphere actually ablate or sputter. That just means air molecules knock bits off the particles. And all the methods that I'll be referring to today to try to measure that quantity um, and these are things like radars, lidars, uh, looking for meteor smoke in the atmosphere with rockets or, or uh, optical extinction, deposition at the surface, detection in ice cores. All of these are really measuring the ablated, the, the vaporized fraction of the incoming material. It's only if you uh, go into space and make collection there that you can, in principle anyway, measure the total amount. And the uh, big project that I have underway at the moment, sponsored by the European uh, Research Council, it's called CODETA, uh, and uh, it's really looking at this whole picture here, which is sort of summarized in this uh, flow chart, and I'll just use this to kind of, uh, as a contents page for the talk. Now, the red boxes here show various sort of aspects of the science that we're interested in. So, interplanetary dust particles in the solar system, ablating, making metal ions and atoms, forming smoke particles, what they can do in the mesosphere and the stratosphere, and eventually deposition to the surface. So we'll deal with all of these. 
Um, the yellow boxes here are the sort of modeling uh, component of the study. And the backbone of the project actually is the Wacom model, which uh, NCAR have very kindly provided to us. Uh, so at the top here, we have to have a meteor input function to feed these metallic species into Wacom. We need all sorts of physicochemical quantities, um, things like rate coefficients for gas phase reactions, uptake coefficients for heterogeneous processes, uh, various uh, particle microphysics type of, of parameters here. And then further down in the atmosphere, looking at the effects on acidic gases, uh, freezing of sulfuric acid droplets. So this is all the physical chemistry that's needed to uh, feed into Wacom. And then, of course, in the blue boxes here are all the different ways you can test different components of this. So radars look at the head echoes of the particles coming in. We've got metal lidars to look at the metal atoms. Uh, rockets to look at charged particles. Satellites can do optical extinction of the smoke. Aircraft can sample at the bottom of the stratosphere. And finally, ice cores at the surface. So that's the sort of overall structure of the project. And in the talk, <clears throat> I'll begin by talking about the metal layers, because we actually know most about them, uh, then talk a little bit about uh, ablation and so on before getting into smoke, how we can measure it, the uncertainties in that, and then finish off as the smoke would, descending to the surface. So we'll start off with metal layers. Um, and these have been observed for several decades by the LIDAR technique. Uh, these are four metals that can be seen from the ground uh, because they've got nice optical transitions. And these layers, you see, peak around 90 kilometers in the atmosphere, and they're a few kilometers thick. And uh, when you look at them in a seasonal framework, so this is height here against month of the year. These are, are nighttime measurements. That's not uh, very relevant to this. You can see uh, one very interesting feature, which I'll come back to uh, later on, and that is that mostly they have minima in uh, summer. So this is, these are all in the mid-latitudes in the northern hemisphere. These all have minima, but potassium has this big peak and a clear semi-annual oscillation. And I think we have finally understood why that is after many uh, decades, actually half a century. The way that we are doing the modeling in a little bit more detail then is we have this zodiacal uh, dust cloud model uh, called uh, Zodi for short. We ablate uh, these particles using a chemical ablation model. And that provides the meteor input function to feed Wacom down here. Um, we then have to put in the chemistry of all of these uh, species that will ablate from meteors. And that's about 120 reactions, uh, both neutral and ionic. That's all gone in now. And then we have these. Uh, different ways of testing Wacom. So let's see where we uh, have got to with that. This is a schematic drawing here of the chemistry of iron. So this is based on uh, uh, reactions that we've studied in my uh, group over quite a number of years. Um, there's iron chemistry, which tends to occur in the E region, above 100 kilometers. And then there's neutral chemistry, which tends to be uh, predominant below 85 kilometers. And I'll later on tell you about new experimental techniques we've developed in Leeds to look at uh, these dissociative recombination reactions. For some uh, reason, they have never been studied. Uh, and yet, are very important because they're the only way to go from an atomic ion like this back to the neutral, at least in a rapid uh, turnover sense. And then in the neutrals here, the problem that you have with a lot of these compounds is they don't have any laser-induced fluorescence spectra. So the standard tool for looking at the rates of these reactions isn't available. But we have a new technique now which allows us to see all of these <coughs> and study their kinetics. So that's the chemistry. Then you need an ablation model. And we have this model here called CADMOD. Um, this is the flow chart of how it works. And I just want to uh, mention the uncertainty that's involved here. What CADMOD does is it assumes a little particle comes into the atmosphere. It flash heats, melts, and you get a chemical uh, thermodynamic equilibrium in the melt exchanging with the gas phase. There's a ball of vapor around the particle. And that vapor then 
uh, expands into a, a, almost a vacuum, uh, a process known as Langmuir evaporation. A lot of uncertainties in those two boxes, and I'll show you later a machine we have just commissioned uh, to try to study this for the first time. But before we can test it, this is what the model actually predicts. So this is a standard particle coming into the atmosphere. You get the um, evaporation, first of all, of the more volatile elements, so that's sodium and potassium. And then as the particle flies further down, the more uh, refractory elements, so these are iron, then magnesium and silicon ablate. And finally, the cat elements, calcium, aluminium, titanium ablate at the end here of the flight of the particle. Now, you can take an astronomical model of where all of these particles are coming from in the solar system and compute <laughs> what we refer to as the MIF, the meteoric input function. And this is the one for iron. And this is the latitude here against month of the year, just showing that you get this sort of seasonal variation, very little variation at the tropics, a very large variation at the poles. Uh, that's the height at where the ablation occurs. A lot of uncertainty in that, I should add. And this is for a total amount of two tons per day. So this is at the bottom of this range of two to 270 tons. What do I actually mean by this uh, rate here? What that means is <clears throat> if you integrate this up over the planet, and then you say 18% by mass, is iron in chondritic meteorites, that converts into 2.2 uh, .2 tons of interplanetary dust per day. So this is the results of Wacom. Uh, it's a fantastically efficient chemical integrator because we could put all these species into Wacom, and this is just for iron. We've now done it for six metals. Uh, and we predict where all of these neutrals and ions will occur. The one thing we can test against is uh, LIDAR measurements, uh, as shown here, of iron atoms. And you can see very nice agreement over the, uh, the bulk of the layer down there. Now, you can compare this uh, in more detail. So here are two mid-latitude sites, Urbana and Wuhan. And uh, there are the measurements. Here's the model, and you can just quickly eyeball that and see things look pretty good. We see the summertime minimum, the wintertime maximum, and the absolute quantities and everything looks great. Unfortunately, when you go to the polar regions, <coughs> things come a bit unstuck. So here's some uh, measurements which Shenzhou actually made at South Pole. And here is Wacom. And you can see Wacom is really overcooking things rather dramatically at uh, the South Pole, and uh, it's interesting to think why it's going wrong. And there are sort of a number of reasons here that I've uh, indicated. What happens in the winter is that you get convergence of the low latitude air over the pole, which then feeds down into the polar vortex. And so obviously, if the meridional wind is too strong, you could have too much convergence. Secondly, and this is related to the first point, if the iron stays in the gas phase for too long, as it's being essentially sucked over the pole and concentrated there, you'll build up too much. If you can remove it more quickly before it gets there, then you won't have this big build up. And the third point, also related to the strength of meridional circulation, is the temperature variation can be too strong. So too hot in the middle of winter, where things are converging, and then too cold in the middle of summer, when you get <laughs> divergence from the upwelling air. And I'll refer back to some of these things later. What about ions? Well, ions are more difficult to do because all we've got for most of these metals is uh, a series of, of uh, rocket measurements. So here are three different rocket flights. Here are the ion, uh, the Fe+, plus, and this is Wacom model. And down here, things are OK, but you see they come unstuck up here. These Fe plus, uh, the measurements are nearly two orders of magnitude too small. And when we published this last year, we said this might be because there wasn't a correct treatment of electrodynamics in Wacom. But more recently, we've moved on to look at magnesium. And magnesium ions, uniquely at the moment, um, can be measured from space. Uh, we've got a global picture of the magnesium ions. Here it is from Skirmaki. This is from the Bremen group. Uh, <coughs> Langowski is the uh, 
student who has done the work. And here is Wacom. You can see things look pretty good. I mean, there's a minor problem, which is that the hemisphere is the wrong way around. Uh, the peak is here, but you know, let's not worry about that. Let's focus on up here, where the, um, the this is where the discrepancy was in the FE plus around 110 kilometers. And if you compare the colors there, it actually looks fine. So I actually wonder if there's a problem with all those old rocket borne measurements when the rockets get up this high that something has gone a bit wrong. Something to think about. Now, this is uh, the latest thing that um, well, I've been up to, really. Uh, and that was to come up with an explanation for potassium, which I've been trying to do for years. Um, this is the schematic chemistry of potassium. The potassium ion is a very unusual creature because it's a very big ion. It's only got one plus on it. Uh, and so the way it neutralizes is by things like nitrogen attaching to it. And if it's a really big ion, the electric field is actually quite weak. And so you only form complexes like this and even these more stable ones at really low temperatures. So if it gets very cold, there's a route back to neutral potassium. Otherwise, most of the potassium stays as ions. On the neutral side, potassium <coughs> gets locked up via a series of reactions here as potassium bicarbonate. And in the case of sodium, there's a route back to neutral potassium via H atoms. And that gives it a real temperature dependence. But with potassium, that's different. So this is how to make the bicarbonate. This is a potential energy surface for the uh, physical chemists in the audience. And uh, this just shows there are two ways to get to here. Both of them are submerged below the entrance channel of this potential surface. So it's a nice, fast reaction. The, back, the way back from bicarbonate to potassium, <clears throat> unfortunately, there are three different ways to do it. H atoms can uh, come in and attack different parts of this molecule. They all have very significant barriers. This doesn't happen at any temperature in the mesosphere. It's always too slow. The only way back is via photolysis, and this is a theoretical calculation we've done to compare with um, sodium, which we have measured in the laboratory, sodium bicarbonate, so we can put this uh, potassium theory, uh, theoretical spectrum on an absolute scale. And when you put all of that chemistry into Wacom, you actually get a really nice result. <clears throat> the top here shows measurements. This is made at Kulingsborn in Germany. And so this is month of the year against altitude. And you see this midsummer maximum when it's really cold and the ions are turning into neutral potassium. And you have these two minima <coughs> here at the equinoxes. And this is matched very nicely by Wacom. Sodium, on the other hand, you see just has a annual variation, the midsummer minimum and the uh, wintertime maximum. This is um, a uh, result from Dan's recent paper with us looking at sodium. And this um, is these two panels up here show a global observations of sodium, more or less global. And this is uh, from my student Erin's work using the OSIRIS spectrometer on ODIN to capture uh, potassium for the first time. And you see up here, <clears throat> there's the summertime minima, uh, maximum and the two equinoctial minima. You don't get uh, measurements all year round. Um, that's because it has to be observing the day glow. Here's... Uh, Wack and potassium, and you can see it actually matches really beautifully, at least what we can see in the uh, data, and there's very nice contrast for sodium. So this is a problem I think we have finally solved, which always bugged me. Why is it that two alkali metals behave completely differently from each other when you know every grade school chemist would say, oh, they should be the same? <clears throat> Why is there this uh, minimum here? Uh, well, there if you go through the chemistry of how to convert potassium to bicarbonate, uh, there's a minimum in atomic oxygen at the equinoxes and maxima of H2 and CO2. And if you just look at this very simple sequence of reactions here, if you maximize H2 and CO2 at the, this time of the year, you push through to there. And if you have a minimum in O, O tries to go back this way, but if that's at a minimum, 
then of course this is reduced, and so that makes it even more favorable to lock everything up as bicarbonate. Okay, so we'll just go into the lab now for a minute, and I'll show you some uh, nice new things that we're doing there. Uh, this is Juan Carlos uh, Gomez Martin's work, and this is a new time of flight mass spec, which was sold to us as a universal detector of anything you want. Of course, it's turned out in practice not to be quite uh, like that, but it's to look at species like this, which nobody's ever seen before, and are very important, not just in the upper atmosphere, but combustion chemistry and so on. And uh, we want to then look at photochemistry of some of these things, reactions with O and H, and um, eventually, next year, how they polymerize to start to make smoke particles. So here's a uh, schematic drawing of the instrument. This is the TOF over here, and we have some source of metal here. It could be ablation of a rotating target, or it could be a high temperature furnace. Anyway, the metal atoms somehow get out here, and they then are entrained in a flow, reactions are added, and we sample them here with a pinhole, um, and then the um, expanding uh, molecular beam here is crossed by a laser, which could be um, the tripled third harmonic of a YAG, which gives you um, really strongly ionizing radiation at 180 nanometers or 10 and a half volts. So that ionizes a lot of molecules. But we've actually found for doing metal uh, compounds that we use a multi-photon ionization in the near UV. Um, so here are some examples with iron. This is working so nicely we can actually see the isotopes of iron, which are uh, over here. This is, as I said, a pure iron target, but of course you find all kinds of other rubbish uh, coming out as well. Now the nice thing is you can immediately start to see these clusters, and this is of course what meteor smoke is. Uh, so we're very confident that uh, we'll be able to build up bigger particles, and this machine is designed to see things up to 5,000 AMU, which is quite a big cluster. Sodium is the same thing. We can build whole families of sodium oxides here, uh, and you know the great thing is that uh, one can then start to do kinetics on them. And the bigger they get, the easier they are to ionize. So again, it's a very nice way to see big particles. Uh, some kinetic tests. This is a, a sort of workhorse reaction for sodium. And we can see the growth here of the product, sodium oxide. Uh, for the first time, it's not been possible to see that molecule before. And the resulting rate constant agrees very well with uh, the literature. Um, now, what excited me a lot more was sodium hydroxide, because this is a key species in making bicarbonates. And um, this is the absorption cross-section of NaOH that we measured a long time ago um, by uh, using a method we couldn't actually see the, bicarbonate, the hydroxide directly. We hit it with a photon here and are able to produce lovely uh, signals of NaOH+. Plus. This is the three photon um, uh, ionization scheme, but it's resonance enhanced because the uh, first photon is over here. So this is a reaction making NaOH um, and then adding CO2 to it to make the bicarbonate, and we can see that going away. Uh, these other ions up here are you know, very interesting clusters. This is all stuff to be looked at in the future. Um, here is the... Uh, the first reaction after you make NaO in the atmosphere, that's from the reaction of sodium with ozone to make NaOH. And, you know, for the first time in this game, we can actually look at the reactant and the product simultaneously and plot them both on here and you get a very nice rate constant, which agrees very well with some work done in this town way back in 1987. Um, you can see a later paper by me, which was actually a factor of two lower, which I think is now wrong, demonstrating how nice it is to be able to actually see the stuff you think you are watching. Um, here is uh, the formation of the bicarbonate, and now we actually find we are about a factor of two lower than Asia and Howard, and for the first time, uh, so here's the third order rate constant, uh, would be the slope of the red line here. This is the second order rate against the pressure, 
And you can fit that very nicely using RRKM theory, which is a semi-empirical kinetic theory, uh, which you just cannot fit this very fast uh, reaction here. So I'm very pleased that that has sort of finally, I think, understood. Now, the second thing I'm experiment I was going to talk about is uh, dissociative recombination. And as I said, this is a really neglected field. There's only been one metal-containing molecule ever studied uh, reacting with electrons. And uh, the reason appears to be that a while ago, somebody said, oh, these reactions all have this rate constant, so there's no re need to study them. Um, and that, of course, is not uh, the truth. Um, this is the machine we've built. Uh, it's a flowing afterglow system. So we produce a plasma here, which it, uh, essentially ends up as argonions and electrons. That flows past an iron rod where we're ablating uh, with a laser to make Fe plus. We add N to O to make FeO plus, and then we look at the dissociative recombinations that flows down here towards a quadrupole mass spec. So to do the kinetics of this, you have to measure the absolute electron density, and that's done using a Langmuir probe. Um, there is the probe, and <clears throat> this is just a, a wire that sticks out into the plasma, and you scan the voltage on it and measure the uh, current. So this is a typical trace, scanning the voltage, and the current starts off very, very small because, of course, electrons are not attracted to a negative bias. But once you go positive, it jumps up like this. And by an analyzing the slopes of various things there, you actually get out the absolute electron density using this uh, kind of cooking recipe here. Um, so here are some uh, results. Um, we do this <coughs> by ratioing the FeO plus to Fe plus using the reaction Fe plus plus N2O to make that. So here is a fit of a model, which I, is quite complex, I won't go into now, to the data before the plasma is turned on, and that gives us a nice rate constant here in agreement with uh, various literature values. Then when we turn on the plasma, this ratio really drops because, of course, we are destroying the molecular ion by recombination with electrons. And by fitting through here, we've got a rate constant at the moment around 3 times 10 minus 6. So that's one order of magnitude faster than this so-called typical value. And that makes quite a difference to the model, in fact. So uh, I think it's worth pursuing that. The third experiment we're doing, and this is really my favorite, this is an attempt to uh, look at shooting stars in the lab. And it's really designed to test the predictions of this chemical ablation model. Uh, and there are two things we want to do. First of all, we want us to be sure that that differential ablation I showed you where sodium and potassium come out first, then iron, then calcium, and so on, really happens when you have a melt that's flash heated. And then also to measure the rate of evaporation, test something called the hertz knudsen relationship. If you take the model, <clears throat> this shows the sort of time scale over which flash heating occurs. So, this is a 10 microgram particle, which is typical of the, the most common uh, particle mass uh, contributing to the, the, the input into the atmosphere is a range of speeds. And once you get up to 21 kilometers a second, the flash heating is uh, over very, very quickly. So we had to design a system that would flash heat uh, you know, on a second sort of time scale, getting up to above 3,000 Kelvin. We have a very fast response pyrometer that can measure that uh, over this range of temperatures here, so from just above 1,000 to 3,000. And the key thing then is to look at what's coming off these particles uh, very, very fast. So here is the ablation simulator. There's a tungsten ribbon in here, which is flash heated um, with a high current. The, um, Metals are measured using two lasers by laser-induced fluorescence. And um, we have to do this because the experiment is over in two seconds. We need a very fast repetition rate laser. So we have a 250 hertz YAG laser pumping the two dye lasers. And we collect data at 500 hertz. So we have a background to subtract because, of course, you get a lot of scattered light as this um, 
filament here gets white hot. And then we have the pyrometer here watching it to record the temperature at the same time. Um, that's just a photograph showing the pyrometer staring into here. This is yellow because we're looking at sodium. So there's the Lytron YAG pumping the two dilasers here. And there's one photomultiplier recording the sodium vapor. Uh, this is just a very first measurement. So you can see within uh, two and a half seconds, the sodium has completely evaporated and the temperature's gone up to sort of two and a half thousand Kelvin. So this is looking promising and a lot of fun. Right, on to meteor smoke. Um, Wacom has uh, the ability to couple to an aerosol microphysics model called Karma, and the version that we're using has got 28 bins that cover particles from, with radii from 0.2 up to 100 nanometers, and we can look at uh, the growth by co uh, coagulation. And our target for the first part of this study was uh, really for the first time to have explicit formation of particles starting from metal atoms, not saying a certain amount of particles are going into the top of the atmosphere, which is what people have done in the past. So the one um, constituent of meteori meteoroids that I haven't talked about so far is silicon. Um, we actually did a project a few years ago looking at a lot of this chemistry over here and, and basically found that silicon chemistry is not that complicated. You basically drive everything to silicon dioxide here. So the final question in understanding its contribution to smoke particles is what happens next. And as I've shown here, you can add two waters to make <coughs> silicilic acid. Um, and the first hydration, you can see it's downhill all the way to this compound here. And that takes about 100 seconds in the mesosphere. Um, and even faster is to add the second water to make this little bristly hedgehog-like thing here, which uh, only takes about 10 seconds. So this is where the silicon dioxide should all end up. And that then polymerizes with other compounds to make smoke. Now, with Wacom, we're able to put all of this uh, chemistry into the model. And this then shows us where the major constituents of the smoke. So these are the sort of stable reservoirs for metal compounds on the underside of the layer where most of the smoke forms. Uh, there, here are their predicted concentrations. <clears throat> Once they polymerize and start to make smoke, then metal atoms, which are in the layers up here, and even ions can then also add onto those smoke particles. And these are the sort of reactions that occur. So you can uh, the first is a class called a condensation reaction because you can take something like this magnesium hydroxide, react it with this, and out comes a water. And that's why it's called a condensation reaction. You can take FeOH <coughs> and this silicilic acid do the same thing. And these are exothermic processes, at least according to quantum theory. And then there's just straight polymerization where you can combine these sorts of things to form you know, nice looking ring structures and so on big negative delta H's, so they happen very uh, happily. And so how do we actually now make smoke in Wacom? Well, what we know from modeling individually the observed amounts of these four species here, so these are the four main constituents, is that we have seven times as much iron as uh, silicon and about <coughs> similar amounts of magnesium and sodium. And uh, the recipe that we have is we make new particles. So these are the tiny embryonic smoke particles, 0.2 uh, nanometer in radius. So they're really just big molecules, either via polymerization of things like this or the condensation reactions with silicic acid. After that, you can then condense any gas phase metallic species onto these pre-existing uh, smoke particles right through the whole size range. And so they grow that way. And um, of course, the one thing you have to do if you have a, a fully consistent treatment is you must conserve mass. So we do that by fixing the density of these particles at 2 grams per cubic centimeter. And then we uh, make it all volume and mass conserving. And uh, 
what I want to start off doing is just showing you the effect of having smoke in the model, because this then reveals something which I hadn't fully understood before. Here's the measurements of sodium in the atmosphere, combination of LIDAR and satellite. This is from uh, Dan's paper, and you can see it's a really nice agreement. And this had a very small MIF of only uh, five tons per day. If <coughs> you increase that to 16 tons per day uh, and allow it to vary in the way I showed you seasonally, or just say let's keep it globally constant, there's not much difference between those. And the sodium has gone up a little bit compared to here, but it's still sort of acceptable. Um, and this is now using something called the, uh, I've called here the Zodi MIF. So this is using Nesvorni's model. And we actually get a, uh, this is a total input now of 30 tons per day. The sodium MIF is 17 tons per day. So it's gone up a lot from here. And you can see these are not too dissimilar. In the case of iron, um, here's some work from uh, Davis. Uh, so this is uh, Joseph Hufner's LIDAR data, and this is from uh, a paper that Wu Hu Feng led with 2.2 tons per day. So remember, this was the lower limit of this estimate. And <laughs> you can now jack that up by a factor of three. Things don't really change. All go for this Nesvorni model. That's the total of 30 tons per day, of which seven tons per day is the equivalent of the iron ablation. And you have to be hard pressed to say that looks much worse uh, fit uh, to the data here than the original over here. So why is that? Um, and well, the implication, first of all, is that the amount of the metals in the layer, the metal atoms, and that's the thing we can actually observe very precisely from the ground, isn't actually strongly uh, dependent on the amount of uh, meteoric material we're putting into the atmosphere. The reason is that <clears throat> if you put more material in, you make more smoke, and then you remove the stuff faster. And so it, it's a nonlinear chemistry, and um, it means that the metal layers themselves are not a sensitive indicator of the meteoric input function. Um, what it does mean, of course, is that if you have a large MIF, you have to remove the metal really quickly on all of this smoke, and therefore you have much less long-range transport to the poles, which was what I was saying earlier, might be an explanation for why the original Wacker modeling overcooked this stuff over the winter pole. There are two ways to tell if uh, what's going on here is sensible. The first thing we know <laughs> we can do is use rocket-borne measurements of uh, charged MSPs. And the other is to look at uh, satellite measurements of optical extinction. So here is my uh, first and last rocket experiment, the HOTPAY-2, um, being launched. This had all kinds of plasma stuff on board. And the important thing here is it showed this very typical result that if you take the measurements of positive ions, the red line here, and electrons, they're balanced up here because charge is, is neutral. So you have the same number of electrons as positive ions. When you come down here, you see the electrons are disappearing somewhere by two orders of magnitude, below 80 kilometers. And it had always been assumed that this was due to the formation of negative ions. But on this rocket flight, we also measured atomic oxygen. And there was a lot of atomic oxygen up here. And that kills negative ion formation. So the question was, what, where were the electrons going? And um, well, again, here is sort of theoretical calculations, which show that these sorts of simple little molecules with lots of silica in them, so these SiO4 units, have very big electron affinities. In other words, electrons really like to jump onto these molecules and will be hard to get rid of. And it turns out that they, that can explain uh, where the electrons are going. And indeed, these electrons, uh, these charged, negatively charged particles are measured uh, by rocket-borne instruments of the kind that uh, the group uh, in LASP do. So Here's a, a 1D model. I'll show you the, the Wacom result in a moment. This is just a 1D uh, model that I have. 
a microphysical model. So this is the predicted um, number density of particles all the way from 0.2 up to uh, whatever. It doesn't, uh, this is just going up to 10 here, showing that up here where the rockets tend to make their measurements, there should be of the order of 5,000 per cubic centimeter of these meteor smoke particles. Uh, and this model is run for this MIF of around six tons per day. Here's the actual charged measurements. So disregard this uh, down here, because this is where the thing is really turning on. From here onwards, we get a very good agreement between the measurement of charged dust and the modeled uh, amount of charged dust, explaining where all those electrons have gone to. If you go to uh, Wacom now, this is uh, running with our uh, sort of what I would call a, a first principles uh, meteor smoke uh, production using the recipe I showed you earlier. And what you see here is <coughs> that in the winter, you get a lot of build up here and descent. This is now the winter time here, and then uh, it'll flip to the other pole again. Um, 80 kilometers is around here. So the numbers that are being uh, seen up here are sensibly what you measure with rockets like uh, the CHAMP instrument that's the uh, University of Colorado one. So that seems to fit quite nicely. There's one interesting ramification of ramping up the MIF. This is where you have a small MIF, uh, which is called the Anches MIF here, and you can see um, if you just focus on 80 kilometers here, it's very different from when you have this big MIF where things are very rapidly making smoke particles. You have lots and lots of small smoke particles here. So actually making measurements at, at low latitudes would be a nice test of this. You can see there's an order of magnitude different here. If you go to the polar regions, it becomes less clear. So that would be a nice way to test whether that MIF is, uh, that large MIF is actually uh, borne out. The other way to look for smoke is optical extinction, and the AIM satellite does that. Um, they do these incredibly sensitive absorption experiments, you know, better than one part in 10 to the 7. And um, here are the measurements. So this dotted line shows the um, uh, vertical profile of extinction, and this is at high latitudes, I think about 70 south. Um, this is the optical extinction we predict using the small Yanches MIF, and it's really too small over here. You may say, oh, that doesn't look too bad, but we're using the biggest possible extinction coefficient here for, um, it's actually the extinction coefficient for olivine, whereas these particles are unlikely to be that. So when you put in the, uh, the large MIF, uh, this is what you get instead. So you are comfortably above here and could decrease the optical extinction, uh, the extinction coefficients of the particles to come down. Unfortunately, you can see things depart down here from either of these, and there are various explanations for that, which um, Chuck Bardeen, I think, has advanced in the past, you know, uptake of sulfuric acid down here, that the particles are changing and perhaps growing. Anyway, things are sort of in the ballpark. So let's just quickly go down to the surface now. Um, well, actually, we'll just start off with uh, the general properties of, uh, of where um, meteoric smoke could impact. One is on act providing an ice nucleus for noctilucent cloud formation. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that now, but that's a very active area of research from people like Marcus Rapp. Um, Another experiment we've done in the lab is we've taken a Knudsen cell and looked at the uptake of nitric acid, because you can imagine these particles are metal rich and acids love them. And um, so we made these measurements at 295 Kelvin and found that the uptake coefficient on either um, a mixed olivine like this or a hematite, gertite, um, are very similar, two to three times 10 to the minus three. And what we've done here is just to compute um, a vertical profile for the removal of nitric acid either by the reaction of OH, it, this is in the polar night, or by uptake on um, 
the smoke that we are modeling. And <clears throat> of, so the shorter the lifetime, that means the more important the process. And actually, the removal on the smoke dominates in the winter uh, polar night. Whether it actually makes much difference is another matter, but it does seem to be more important than the OH reaction. We published a paper a couple of years ago looking at sulfuric acid removal. That also looks possible but requires lab uh, measurements to, of, of the uptake coefficient. My uh, student Sandy James is revisiting another very old problem and that is how to get uh, PSCs to freeze in the stratosphere. Um, Nobody's ever really been able to do this in the lab, though it happens in nature perfectly readily. You can freeze, you know, mixed nitric sulfuric acid and water droplets, uh, and you get, you know, nice clouds like this. Um, so he is busy looking at that. There was a study done by Maggie Tolbert's group that you see here, which saw some very unusual effects on the freezing point of these, uh, at least on sulfuric acid water solutions, when you loaded them up with iron and magnesium ions, which is what will happen when smoke particles dissolve in them. So let's now finish off with deposition to the surface. And um, I got into this business by working with a group. Uh, we got this uh, paper published. My part of the study was the worst bit of it, in my view. But what we found in this was that based on the amount of iridium and platinum that was deposited in the ice cores in Greenland, that corresponded to um, an input of 300 tons per day into the atmosphere, which was ridiculously high. And that indicated that somehow this smoke, which had come all the way from the mesosphere down the polar vortex and then got into the troposphere, must be really being concentrated over Greenland, which does have a very high snowfall uh, relatively speaking. Um, and so since then, I've been trying to understand how that could really happen. Um, there have been measurements in Antarctica of the two, the same two cosmic indicators, iridium and platinum. And also there's an Italian group uh, who do measurements of paramagnetic ions. So this is the magnetic uh, susceptibility of very small iron-containing particles. And uh, so when we set about modeling this, we wanted to know, you know whether our model was any good at all. And um, to do that, we used the, this uh, unfortunate accident of um, the uh, SNAP uh, generator on this uh, rocket launch here. So this was uh, launched in 1964. It didn't reach orbit, and as designed, the plutonium reactor ablated over somewhere near Madagascar. So it was actually like a, you know, a, a meteor ablation experiment. And um, the plutonium eventually came to Earth, and because it was an unusual isotope, it was possible to measure it and distinguish it from the plutonium being produced from atomic bomb tests in the atmosphere at the same, t or hydrogen bomb tests at the same time. And um, that's, uh, so this is the uh, uh, unusual isotope here, uranium two uh, plutonium-238. Uh, so, so for this study, we used the Met Office Unified model with uh, the SlimCat uh, version that Martin Chipperfield has produced. And this is where we predicted the plutonium should mostly have been deposited at the surface. The little boxes here show measurements of plutonium, and they don't perfectly line up, but it generally agrees quite well. And if you look here against latitude, you see there was much more deposition in the southern hemisphere than north, because uh, the, um, the ablation took place somewhere here. And uh, we uh, model that quite nicely, and this purple line is the one that we decided was the best fit to everything. So having tuned the model and the wet deposition scheme for small um, nanoparticles, we then set to work on where the smoke would be deposited. <clears throat> and the way this model is run, in this case, is we just feed in a sprinkling of particles at the top. So this is before we got into how to, to really make smoke. 
Um, and this shows if the atmosphere has no smoke in it, and then you start pouring it in at 80 kilometers, how long it does it take to get to the surface? The black line here shows the amount that's in the atmosphere. So that reaches the steady state, because you're pouring it in continuously at the top and removing it at the bottom. And that takes about 2,000 days to reach a steady state. This is the deposition of the surface. And once that becomes linear, you've also reached steady state. So that's about there. The blue line here is deposition in Greenland. And these are two sites in Antarctica. And we get a very nice more than tenfold difference between Greenland and Antar central Antarctica. And that corresponds very closely to the relative snowfall in Greenland versus Antarctica. So where does the deposition mostly occur? <coughs> well, as you can see, there are two bands here, mid-latitude bands. There's a bit of a hot spot of, over Greenland here, and you can see that is 10 times more than central Antarctica. But the really interesting thing is the deposition here into the Southern Ocean. And the reason that that's um, interesting, I'll explain on the next slide. The model was run for a, a global uh, ablation input of 27 tons per day. So that's already more than I've been talking about in all of the earlier scenarios. But when we compared the amount of iron going into Greenland or Vostok and Epica in Antarctica, we needed to increase that by between three and four times to measure the amount seen in the ice, which would in, imply an ablated flux between 75 and 100 tons per day. Well, we've never been anywhere near that. We started with two tons, if you remember. And that's even 20 times more than we needed to model the hot pay two rocket experiment. So what does this imply? Either that uh, <laughs> there's an even greater focusing in the polar regions, that trans exchange from the stratosphere into the troposphere is occurring not through mid-latitude tropopause folding, but somehow there's more efficient removal at high la uh, latitudes directly from the lower stratosphere. There's also possible, of course, of contamination of the measurements themselves, which are ultra, ultra trace species uh, measurements. But we do have the two different things, iridium and platinum on the one hand, superparamagnetic iron on the other, and they agree well. Um, but why does this matter? Well, the interesting thing is that our predicted deposition here, when we scale it up to actually match what's measured in the ice, uh, gives us this input per year. Um, and this is highly soluble iron because it's dissolved in stratospheric aerosol, um, sulfuric acid droplets. So it's very soluble iron uh, sulfate. Uh, and you can compare that to the aeolian dust input into the Southern Ocean, which is around 30 uh, of these micromoles. So it's 20 times bigger. But this is very insoluble. It's desert dust, uh, perhaps 1% solubility maximum. And this indicates that perhaps the input from space of iron into the Southern Ocean, bioavailable iron, is 400% that from uh, uh, terrestrial aeolian sources. The Southern Ocean is iron deficient, so if there is some function which is changing the amount of iron being deposited in the ocean, uh, that will affect the drawdown of CO2. And of course, then there's an interesting link with climate. OK, so that's the end of my talk. But I just wanted to alert you to something interesting here. And that is a brand new meteor shower is predicted next weekend. Um, so the Earth's shortly going to pass through the trail from this comet, which has never before been into the inner solar system, at least according to the people who model this stuff. It's come from the Oort cloud. And they're estimating there could be up to 200 meters per hour, uh, meteors per hour, which is a, you know, getting on for a, a storm uh, sometime around midnight on uh, the 24th. So that's an advanced warning. And with that, uh, I'll end. Thank you. So do you have questions? This is being recorded, so. Oh, I just, I don't know. Uh, 
I, I just want to know why is there that bullseye on Greenland for that that one of those last figures you showed? Why is Greenland such a hot spot for the deposition? The um, the explanation appears to be something to do with uh, storm tracks over the North Atlantic. But that's as far as I want to commit. This is an area I, I'm not an expert in. But that's certainly why there are these hot spots down here as well. It's to do with where these storm tracks go. So in, uh, in boundary layer particle formation, we uh, have been talking a lot about ion-induced nucleation because we recognize that ion-neutral reactions are so much faster mm -hmm. than these neutral processes. But as I understand what you presented, you largely treat the formation of these original clusters as just the neutral reactions between iron or metal oxides. And if, if that's true, is that just because there are no metal ions around to participate in this nucleation process? No, um, there are ions, but um, at the height where this is happening, 80 to 85 kilometers, the plasma density is quite low. And what really drives uh, these um, species is the fact that the, many of these molecules have very large electric dipole moments. So they are practically ions already. And in the case of iron, um, uh, there's also ma a magnetic dipole, a very long-range magnetic dipole that's exerted. Uh, the moment you get a few iron atoms into a molecule and they align, they're, you know, you have the, like aligning little magnetic domains and you get very long-range capture. So I think to form meteor smoke, you don't really need um, iron-induced uh, nucleation. Perhaps when they come to um, act as ice nuclei for uh, noctilucent clouds that I didn't want to go into today, uh, charging is important. Uh, John, uh, 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 thank you very much for giving such a comprehensive uh, talk. You probably put in so much uh, information. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one is regarding your new uh, measurement rate, FE O plus, yes. uh, the associative recombination with E. Uh, so you got uh, the new rate is 10 times higher than the traditional one. So What's the implication of that? Uh, mainly two things. One is for these sporadic layers, uh, usually below 115 uh -huh. kilometer. The other one, do you think it will have some implication for those thermospheric layers we ob observed above 130 kilometer? Uh, not probably above 130 because there's not enough ozone to be making much FeO plus. So it, it will at the margins. But further down, yes, um, what it means is when you make FeO plus, there's competition. Either an oxygen atom gets it and knocks it back to Fe plus again, stopping neutralization, or the electron gets it. And now, of course, if the electron uh, rate is 10 times bigger, that means it's easier to um, neutralize iron. And when we put that into um, to Wacom, we actually get a much better underside of the, la of the Fe plus layer. It's in much better agreement with rocket uh, measurements. So, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that this is, uh, does seem to work, yeah. So for, for, that, uh, com, uh, com, um, for, the, for the other reaction which compete with this, 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 this dissociative recombination, I mean, do you trust the rate or do you want to measure that, that one as well? The radiative recombination? Yeah, the, because the one you measured is 10 times higher. Yes. The, the, the compete reaction rate, do, can we really trust it? Um, I think so, because, uh, I mean, that's really basic atomic physics. One hesitates to say trust a model, but in this case, um, I, I, I think I would. Um, it's, it's an extremely difficult thing to measure, because whenever you contain the ions in, um, in the laboratory, even in an iron trap, to hold them long enough and stop them making molecules in the presence of electrons very hard. Um, so I, I'd stick with the calculations for that. Okay. Yeah, I, I ask another question? Yeah. The second question is regarding this uh, your new results of meteor smoke particle yeah. put into uh, Wacom. So I wanted to know because Dan is also here. Dan is the 
the, 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 the person really hot on this uh, horizontal transport. Yes. Okay, so according to his model, after that, the, the whatever meteor smoke comes in, I mean, those are the species of sodium iron, they can transport from pole to pole because so many days yeah. they can stay in the atmosphere. So I wanted to know with your new, uh, new results, what do you think about the, 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 the lifetime? for these uh, metal species to stay in the atmosphere. Well, and is said, there it, some way we it, can it really can, It can come down from weeks to just a couple of days. The, if the MIF is large and you make smoke and remove the atoms, the lifetime can get very short. And that might help to reconcile the problem we've had at the pole with too much iron building up, as I showed in that uh, picture. Uh, but it's not the only reason for that. And as I said, um, I'm not convinced that the having this large input that we have um, is producing smoke profiles that look quite right as a function of, of latitude. But I mean, I'm hoping to spend uh, my time here with um, Chuck Bardeen and Dan, you know, going into this, seeing if we can really constrain this. Um, but there is still the problem of explaining all of this input into the ice caps, you know, which is measuring the integrated input at the end of the day, and, and it's enormous compared to what we're talking about here. So there's something really weird going on. So perhaps uh, a good way to test it is somehow to measure the lifetime of those metal species. But how can we do that? Well, you can only do it if you know the rate of removal or the rate of input. You know, like what Dan suggested, maybe the harm is something we will try to do this. Oh, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you, uh, in your model, how many days is it? Uh, several weeks, I think. Yeah, yeah, several weeks. How many? Two, three, four, five? Two and to three. Something yeah, like but we, there's also a lower limit on how, sh how short that lifetime can be because if we assume that there's some seasonality in the meteor input function, if you have a very short lifetime, it would look identical to the MIF, the, the seasonal distribution. So we can't make it so short that it looks, because we, we know it doesn't look like the MIF. So, so I think we can bound it, and that's what we'll try and do. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I want to know how many days are short, how many days are long? <laughs> Well, I think if it's less than about four or five days, <clears throat> you get the effect Dan described, which is you just start to see the MIF. You know, the autumn maximum, the spring minimum, and you don't really see that. So um, I, I think it can't be that short, but it could be like a week or longer. <laughs> Any last questions? If not, we'll thank John again.